God's house of prayer and his house in heaven. The northern kingdom of Samaria was inhabited by Gentiles, imported by the Assyrians, who had defeated the Israelites of the north before the Assyrians were defeated by the Babylonians. The Babylonians, who later defeated the southern kingdom of Judah and deported them to the lands of Assyria, Babylonia, eventually Persia, completed the total exile of the 13 tribes of Israel from the lands of Abraham. Uh, the North Kingdom was also called Israel, uh, of course Samaria, and Ephraim. Then the king of Assyria marched against the whole land. He came to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshi, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. He deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled them in Hala, at the river Habor, at the river Gazan, and in the towns of Medea. That's 2 Kings, chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuta, Abba, Hamath, and Sepharvan, and he settled them in the towns of Samaria in place of the Israelites. They took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its towns. That's 2 Kings, 17, verse 24. They worshipped the Lord, but they also appointed from their own ranks priests of the shrines who officiated for them in the cult places. They worshipped the Lord while serving their own gods, according to the practices of the nations from which they had been deported. To this day, they follow their former practices. They do not worship the Lord properly. They do not follow the laws and practices, the teaching and instruction that the Lord enjoined upon the descendants of Jacob, who was given the name Israel, with whom he made a covenant and whom he commanded, you shall worship no other gods. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. That's 2 Kings, chapter 17, verse 32 through 35. God said, As for the foreigners <clears throat> who attach themselves to the Lord to minister to Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and who hold fast to my covenant, I will bring them to my sacred mount and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices shall be welcome on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. That's Isaiah chapter 56, verses 6 through 7. In Judaism today, this would mean converting to Judaism applied to foreigners including Christian Israelis and Muslim Israelis. If they want to enter the third temple, they must hold fast to God's covenant with the Jewish people. They must follow the laws and practices, the teaching and instruction that the Lord enjoined upon the descendants of Jacob, who was given the name Israel, with whom he made the covenant. A house of prayer for all peoples means a house of prayer for all Jewish people who are people from the nations of the earth. God knew they would be defeated, deported, and dispersed throughout the world. This was a part of God's plan when he formed Israel for the new heaven he was creating. He chose them and the land for them and had the Hebrew Bible in its entirety written at his command and direction through his anointed ones and his prophets. God 
is creating a new heaven of the spirits and souls of the Jewish people for the name of Israel to endure. Those who are righteous and in right standing with him will be placed in angelic bodies as a new host of the Lord of hosts, a host of angels representing the people of the world. The angels of Israel. And that's why it's a house of prayer for all peoples, all Jewish people. And you can't be worshiping false gods as those that have been imported in the northern kingdom. Eli Weasel said in regard to God in the Holocaust in the lost version of night. Quote, This time we will not stand as the accused in court before the divine judge. This time we are the judges. And he is the accused. We are ready. There are a huge number of documents in our indictment file. They are living documents that will shape the foundations of justice. Job was also ready to indict God. Job wanted God to explain to him why he, as a righteous man who followed the Lord's commandments, had so many bad things happening to him. I am sure that God is quite pleased with creation because he is perfect. And all things he creates are perfectly what he wanted for him. It is perfect for creating a heaven of angelic human spirit persons. A new heaven by the addition of a new host of angels, the angels of Israel. God decided to create a new host of angels, one where he does not create their personalities as with the angels of heaven, but angelic persons who were formed as persons by their own actions and self-will. Unlike angels, we are put through a battleground of choices with our own self-will that molds and shapes us as persons. Angels do not have self-will or a battleground of choices to make. Their persons are created and formed by God. God knew in the beginning that all men would suffer, the good and the bad. It is what makes our personality suitable for His purpose of creating a new host of angels. Quote, For behold, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered. They shall never come to mind. Be glad then and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I shall create Jerusalem as a joy and her people as a delight. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in her people. Never again shall be heard there the sounds of weeping and of wailing. It's Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 19. Quote, No more shall there be an infant or gray beard who does not live out his days. He who dies at a hundred years shall be reckoned a youth, and he who fails to reach a hundred shall be reckoned a curse. They shall build houses and dwell in them. They shall plant vineyards and enjoy their fruit. They shall not build for others to dwell in or plant for others to enjoy. For the days of my people shall be as long as the days of a tree. My chosen ones shall outlive the work of their hands. They shall not toil to no purpose. They shall not bear children for terror, but they shall be a people blessed by the Lord, and their offspring shall remain with them. That's Isaiah chapter 65, verses 20 through 23. And there's a reason I broke it up like that, because it could have all gone together. <coughs> In verses 17 through 19, God is speaking of a spiritual heaven that he calls Jerusalem. Verses 20 through 23 are what heaven was believed to be like for the people of the ancient age and the Middle Ages. God's scripture, scripture is written for eras gone by, and heirs to come. 
People of ancient times in the Middle Ages thought of the dead coming back to life and living long lives in a brutal, savage time of humanity. Planting vineyards and enjoying the fruit and not having it taken by others, dwelling in a home they had built, and not toiling for others was the heaven they thought of, not a spiritual heaven where you rise to God and live with Him. To them, God was always angry and the cause of their troubles. I mean, if you think about it, with no medicine, no science, no knowledge, no schooling, no universities, when you had lost your loved one, the spouse would walk out to the graveside and just go, I wish you could come up out of there and come back to me. That's, how, that's as far as they could think of it. They, they weren't thinking, I wish you got into the hospital, I wish you had eaten better foods, I wish you hadn't drank so much. Said, it was just, I wish you could come out of the ground and be with me. That's heaven to them. And today it's still prayed for by Orthodox as a fundamental principle of, of Judaism in the 13 principles of Ramban. Billions of people is what you're talking about appearing out of nowhere in the land of Israel. I don't know that you could fit them all in. For as the new heaven and the new earth which I shall make shall endure by my will, declares the Lord, so shall your seed in your name endure. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 22. God says he is creating a new heaven and a new earth. The new earth will be just as this is, earth is, when this earth is no more, when the final judgment of entry to heaven is made by the Creator who holds the souls of all men in his hand. The new heaven where the seed and name of Israel shall endure. And God will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in her people while the new earth is being formed. God calls the new heaven Jerusalem as a direct reference to heaven being for the Jewish people of the name Israel shall endure. Quote, I am sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your offenses since my name, Hashem, is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. Genesis chapter 23 verses 20-22 In heaven, God is in you as my name is in the angel of his presence. That is what is meant when God says, before they pray, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will respond. The information of our minds gathered by our eyes and ears is interpreted by our spirit and soul. Interpreted. It's not where your thoughts are. If that's true, there can be no heaven for any of us because our mind turns to dust. The spirit that God gives us, an element of the unseen realm of God, literally translates the little electrical signals and the chemicals and the, the, the tissue of the brain in different areas, different loads, which is the person that we are, our spirit and soul. Our spirit can read the electrical impulses, chemicals, and different tissues of various parts of the mind. In heaven, our spirit and soul no longer has a mind filled with information to interpret. Spirit is very complicated element of the unseen realm of God. God will be the source of that information. In a sense, God becomes your mind. He provides the information for your spirit to interpret. God can be the information of your mind and the information for every angel and spirit of heaven at the same time. Jesus tells us that he will return in the time of lives and being. The life of the high priest. Oh, uh, I've been asked to, to tell you that uh, I have a lot more on this um, 
God providing the information of your mind in a video um, that is Messianic era versus day of the Lord. That's, there might be a little, few, few more words, but it's Messianic era versus day of the Lord. Uh, which is it? What's it going to be? Well, I don't think there's any question it's going to be day of the Lord. They don't go together. Jesus tells us that he will return in the times of lies and being. The life of the high priest who will see him return. The lives of the people of the towns of Caesarea of Philippi, then living. The generation of lies and being during his life. The lies of his disciples. And the lies of those who pierced him with the spear after he died on the cross. They're all dead now for 2,000 years. Jesus spoke five prophecies of his return with a specific time frame. Lives in being. The measuring lines. And the prophecies all fail. The Apostle Paul said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That, of course, is the rapture. And that just came from Paul. And that's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 17 of the Holy Bible, King James Version. Jesus said he was coming back quickly. On the last page of the Holy Bible in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. This went over five that failed. I don't know how much faith you want to put in there. Revelation chapter 22 verse 7. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. He which testified these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. There's three more prophecies that did not come through. Of course, he's already gone at this time, but he still doesn't come back. And he's talking from heaven through an angel to a writer called John. Who may, by all accounts, it's not John the disciple. Um, although he tries to indicate it is him. Jesus has never returned. For almost 2,000 years, the dead in Christ and those alive during those years have waited to rise to heaven. His prophetic announcement did not happen. There are no Christians in heaven, according to Christianity. And I don't think many of them even know that. <laughs> the time for a quick return has long passed. There is no reason or foundation to believe by faith or otherwise that he will ever return. Heaven is only for the Jewish people. If the Christians want to enter God's house of prayer, on earth and his house in heaven they will have to convert to Judaism they will have to become Jews very observant Jews thank you I hope you enjoyed that